Hi, I'm Jeremy Rustin, the uh, creator of TiddlyWiki, and welcome to the 23rd TiddlyWiki Hangout. Uh, I'm here in Oxford, where winter is starting, um, and I'm joined from around the world by first Adrian. Would you like to say hi and introduce yourself? Hey guys, uh, my name's Adrian. I'm a recent uh, joiner to the TiddlyWiki uh, community. I'm trying to get into, you know, uh, contribute with whatever I can. At this point, I'm just learning, so... I'm probably going to sit back this hangout and discuss with you guys. Great to have you with us again, Adrian. Hi. And Dave, hello, how are you? Good, how are you? Uh, my name is Dave. I'm in Mexico City, and I'm the guy who tries to do everything I can to break Tiddly Wiki. <laughs> so indeed, that's, that's indeed. Really I rely on Dave. <laughs> and Eric, hi. I think Eric may not have a microphone. Microphone, microphone. This is Eric Schulman. I'm the author of Tiddly Tools and uh, currently lead Tiddly Wiki Classic developer. Hi, Eric. Great to have you with us. And Eric's in California, um, I should add. Um, yes, Stephen. it's 8 a.m. here. <laughs> yes, it's nice and early and going to be a nice bright day, probably, unlike the rest of the planet. Um, hi, Stefan. Hi, I'll make it short before my fan starts to, uh, to make noise again. Um, I'm Stefan Rade, coming from Germany, and um, I hope uh, to learn today something about the inner workings of TiddlyWiki so that I can hack it a bit, maybe. Cool. Stefan, it's good to have you here as well. And finally, Ton, how are you? Hi, I'm Ton, Ton Gerner from the Netherlands. I'm a long-time user of uh, TiddlyWiki the classic version and about uh, two months of uh, experimenting with uh, Tiddly D5. Indeed, um, Tom's been making a great contribution. Well, thank you guys, thank you all for being here. Um, uh, scribbled in the sidebar um, that we can see, and actually isn't on the broadcast at this point, is a very brief agenda. Um, I was going to suggest that we did it in the following order. Um, briefly catch up on developments in Tiddly Wiki 5 since last week. Um, answer Joshua Seri's question, which was about creating drop-down lists of values that can be selected and go into a text box. Um, number three, um, uh, answer a question that Dave Gifford asked actually on the group in the week, which was about um, the list widget and particularly the um, shorthand syntax for um, filtered transclusions. And then finally, we was going to address Stefan's question about um, tracing through the code, um, because on past performance, that kind of hardcore code stuff isn't of interest to everybody. So if we do the kind of user stuff first and then do the code stuff, that'll allow um, people who don't want to go into the code stuff to drop out. Does that make sense for everybody? Sure. Truly cool. So I'll... Um, kick off by screen sharing my desktop. Oh, I didn't have a chance to clear up all my tabs, however. Um, this is the latest version, which is um, it's marked here as a pre-release of Alpha 16. So when it when it goes up to 5.tiddlywiki.com, um, it's upgraded to Alpha.16 at that point. Um, oh. Uh, Stefan saying so he can't see the desktop again. Can other people see the desktop? No, I can't. No. <laughs> and annoyingly, it's showing me the desktop as if it's entirely confident that I'm transmitting it to you. Um, last time it did seem as though we needed to wait a little while. I don't know whether to... Perhaps I'll... Uh, let me unshare, actually. And then I'll try sharing again. And let's see if we get any joy. What's what are people seeing now? You, you are freezing. Uh, oh hopefully. yes, there it is. Okay, is that good for everybody, Stefan? Are you seeing that? Oh. Yeah, it's there now. Okay, great. Uh, great. Yes, I see it, except for the top part, I think. And <laughs> again, on the right side, something seems to be. Missing, but this could be also my chat bar. Let's see. Okay. Well, I must say, la last time in the recording, um, when I reduced the window size, it did look like we were losing some details. So I may 
I'll I'll keep it this sort of size unless that's um, uh, causing you to miss everything. Uh, I, I can see it uh, up to your Skype icon in the in the bar up, uh, at the bottom. So everything okay, right from the yeah. That's okay. fine, okay. So then in that case, I will shrink it a little so you can see one thing that's added since last week, which is the um, uh, version number banner. Um, and um, you'll recall that the plan is we'll use that um, after the beta. We'll use that to, as the um, fork me on GitHub button. Um, but for the moment, we think that a more important end user thing is the version number. And I was just saying before that the pre-release string is just because this isn't a, an official release. This is um, between releases. There's intermediate commits in here. So um, the uh, as usual, there's a um, release history that covers the um, changes. Um, one of the big things now is that uh, we've got a new system tag um, page template, which is used for assembling all the page elements. So it means, and this one's for you, Ton, that um, uh, the system to the top sidebar and left sidebar um, are no longer special. Instead, um, you need to create a tiddler with any old name and give it that tag. So that's actually the mechanism by which um, the ribbon got here. So if I go into the system tab, um, you can see, there we go, um, there's a new tiddler. Um, tagged um, tags page template, and it contains um, <clears throat> just a couple of divs um, with this GitHub fork ribbon uh, class on it. Um, so hopefully that will make it a lot easier to add sort of general new page elements, toolbars, that kind of thing, and for plugins to add um, their own ones of those. Um, there's uh, a Oh, and we've fixed the problem that um, I think it was Ton um, who mentioned it, where um, it wasn't possible to change the order if I added a control panel tab, something like this. Um, um, oh, I forgot Are you guys the getting button. the desktop, by the way? Oh, I was hoping some people were. OK. It does seem to be very flaky, this. Adrian, I think we might, uh, on the basis that it's probably being recorded, I shall, I shall continue. Um, okay. But um, is, is, anybody, is anybody else not seeing the desktop besides Adrian? I see the desktop. I uh, see it now even to your um, <coughs> trash can. Oh, great. So you see more of it. <laughs> okay. Well, um, Adrian, I'm sorry. I'm, uh, I'm, 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 I don't want to restart the screen sharing. No, that's fine. What I point. did is I clicked on some somebody else and then back to you, and now um, it appeared. So. Oh, great. Okay. So I was just showing you how um, if I add the control panel tag to a new tiddler, it goes to the end. And um, the issue that we had until this recent change was that if we went into... Um, the list associated with that tag in order to move new tiddler to the start, um, it wouldn't do it because it wasn't happy mixing shadow and non-shadow tiddlers, whereas now it is. So I can now create a control panel tab that's at the beginning. Um, then um, in the control panel, move things around a bit. Um, oh, <laughs> in including putting... I completely on this. Let's get rid of that guy. Right. Um, the control panel's moved around a bit. Um, there's now a saving tab. So the idea here is that this will, um, this should be again driven by tags, so that every installed saver can present some user interface. But right now, it's a static user interface just for Tiddly Spot, and it allows me to set the stuff that used to be in the Tiddly Spot uh, Tiddler. The only thing that's vaguely new is I've also added a link to the backup folder um, because I figure people often won't know that. Um, oh, excuse me, the my other lines game is going to mute you for one second. Here.
Hello, I'm back again. Sorry about that. Um, it was a wrong number too. <laughs> um, which, given that everybody I know knows that I'm busy doing a hangout this afternoon, that would make sense. So yes, I was just showing you how um, now the Tiddly Spot control panel um, includes the link to the backups, which, if you don't know, is quite a handy feature of Tiddly Spot that you can access every backup um, of your wiki and. I was just going to look here. Right, several bugs. Um, the highly embarrassing one that I think several people raised almost simultaneously, that a wiki title with, in fact, uh, any wiki syntax in it um, was failing. Um, and um, a very long-standing problem that's finally fixed. So it used to be the case that if you did a filter that was broken, like that one, which doesn't have an ending, um, then it would crash. Now, instead, um, you get one result from the filter, which is the error message uh, describing what went wrong when it tried to parse it. Um, so there are there will still be some things that make the big red uh, crash dialog appear, but we're slowly trying to get rid of them all. Um, there was... Uh, some issues with importing. Um, they were A, that imp um, dragging, I don't know if you remember doing that kind of thing, dragging and then letting go an item, a tiddler, would cause a crash. Um, and also when we were importing stuff from an existing wiki, it was updating the modified date, and it's more helpful if it doesn't. And then finally, there's um, some internal stuff um, that, um, uh, thanks to... Um, Adrian, we've got the Windows compatible build scripts. Um, so that's all the .sh files that I did for the Mac. We've now got um, line for line transliterations to Windows, which is great. So the same instructions work for Windows. And then um, a whole bunch of messing around that was necessary to solve something that's actually been a problem for a while, that for ages I've had to have uh, yes, Stefan, you, you, modification dates are fixed on import. Now when you import a Tiddler that's already got a modified date, it should um, retain its modified date. But if you import a Tiddler that doesn't already have a modified date, then it will be given um, now as a modified date. Is that no, no. What I meant is uh, you missed the seconds. Do you remember? You have the uh, date. Oh, yes, I think that's fixed too. Yes. Yes, that was another embarrassing bug. <laughs> um, uh, yes, that is fixed. Um, so then here there's some discussion of changing templates around and so on. And the purpose of this is I wanted it to be possible for, you know how if, if I click the download button um, uh, when I'm on 5.tiddlywiki.com, it'll save a copy of the entire wiki, including all the content. And of course, what we really want is for people to be able to save a empty copy of the wiki. Um, and on the current, uh, I think the, a, a recent draft, I just had a link and said right click on it, which um, Mario points out is um, fiddly. Um, so instead, I've done a lot of refactoring that has a few um, side effects. I've made the Google Analytics stuff that TW5.com uses is now a proper plugin, which it wasn't because it was first in there at a time when we didn't have plugins and so on. Um, and um, I've rearranged the save template so that it's possible to save um, uh, an empty wiki as well. So now we've got the beginnings of big green save buttons. So this one um, saves an empty wiki. Oh, only it doesn't because for testing reasons, I only went and oh, because I've got that stuff in. It was trying to save to to this one. Um, so that's saving an empty copy of the wiki, and that's saving a full copy of the wiki. But in both cases, it's rendering the. Um, it's rendering the entire file in the you know in the normal way. So um, that one is two and three. So there's our empty wiki that was saved from TW5.com, and there's the full wiki loaded locally. 
So that's good. Hopefully, should um, and I'm going to make it so the download tiddler is open by default. Um, so hopefully, you should be able to just scroll down, click that um, to get started. Any questions from what I've shown you so far? You, you saw Bob arriving. Oh, I did not. I did not. Hi, Bob. Hiya. How are you doing? All right. Uh, I'm back home and the uh, time zone threw me off, so I was off an hour. Okay, great. Oh, well, I'm glad you made it. Um, uh, we've changed the settings on the Hangout so that I have to manually let you in. So sorry if you were feeling... Ah. No, um, I came right in. Ah, cool, cool. Um, so I was just running through some of the changes since uh, last week and had just run through... So these are um, this is Alpha 16, which I actually meant to release earlier today, but I'll probably release tonight now, um, which is a bunch of um, smallish changes. Still doesn't have the full um, uh, upgrade procedure, which is the thing that's really holding us back from going into beta. Um, but it does now have the ability to save an empty copy of the wiki directly um, just by clicking on that button. Nice. Um, so, I think those were the main things I wanted to draw attention to in terms of changes. Um, yeah. Okay, so if there's um, no questions, I should go on into the first item that we said for the agenda which was um, Joshua asking about drop-down values. Um, so this is how, in the edit template, we've got now a drop-down where I can either type a string to go into the type field of the tiddler, or I can click on the triangle and get a list of available types. And if I click on one of them, um, it goes in that. Um, so before we go, so Joshua's question was, how is that done? Um, before we go and look at the implementation, I was just going to draw your attention um, to some of the uh, tiddlers that are involved. And if I can remember what I called them, there's a, here we go. There's a bunch of shadow tiddlers called doc slash type. Follows dot sorry docs slash types it's plural followed by a mime type um, so I'll open a couple of them so these tiddlers um, contain um, information about each mime type they contain a description field um, uh, with a sort of um, plain text description so for instance the JSON one says JSON data um, and uh, the actual name of it. So that, it's those tiddlers, the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven tiddlers there, that are being picked up for that list. Yeah. So now... Um, Jeremy? Hello? Jeremy, uh, things like uh, SVG and XML, uh, it was possible. It's not in the type list. Oh, yeah, it just means that we should add them. Um, we should probably add them now. <laughs> um, I, SVG, I completely forgot. Let's go in. Um, so back in, if we go into my text editor, and I think I put them here. So let's, uh, we'll take the plain text one, copy it. So... I can never remember. Is that the way, right way around? Um, Right, we shouldn't do too much of this watching Jeremy code because it makes me make more typing errors. But anyway, it's as easy as that to add types. Um, so any that I've forgotten do pipe up in the group and I'll add them. And of course, plugins can add um, their own just by including a tiddler whose title includes that prefix. Jeremy? 
Hi, Ed. A couple of questions. Um, does the drop-down list uh, uh, actually can you use the list as a fixed height list box instead of a drop-down? Oh uh, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. I mean, it's it's just an HTML. Um, oh, well, understood. That that's what I yeah. expected. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Okay. Uh, can it support multiple select? Um, not the way it's written here. I mean, I mean, at the moment, with the action of clicking on one of these things, does two things. It, it clears the pop-up. Oh, it doesn't clear the pop-up. Forgive me. <laughs> um, <coughs> all it does is copy the name field into the nominated field. So then, sorry, the name field of one of those tiddlers into the. So the so multiple select would mean what? Be um, well, I when I implemented the list boxes for uh, to the classic plugin, uh, multi-select uh, basically did a space-separated list of the selected values into the field. Right. Yeah. Now I can imagine that would make sense for some fields, but obviously the type uh, field. Is well, a, yeah. Obviously, that's that's a, a single value. Yeah. But for some fields, you know, select yeah. all that apply, and and yeah. it basically yeah. puts them in. And it's very similar to the um, the list field that you have on Tiddler's. Yeah. Menu. And 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 I was going to say that, and uh, and indeed the tag field as well. I mean, that's that would cool. be one where where editing the tags by having a big list of all the tags and clicking yeah. them on and off would be very useful. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That. So I mean, we could have. Um, tags by checkbox in here, um, where you have a, a checkbox for each of a, a set of tags, and then again, those the tags that you choose to display um, could be selected in a similar way to these tiddlers here being selected. So it, it's obvious that a drop down is a really common EDM um, tiddly wiki five needs to have good support for it. What I've done here is um, what was necessary to get it working in the edit template. There's a bit more work to be done to make it sufficiently easy to do a drop down, you know, that, that somebody else can, can do them. Um, Jared, so that, hello? And another question is about uh, the so-called drop down combo box. Yes. Uh, can, you, can, you, can, uh, you can enter a value into this field? Yes, I can. Yeah. Okay, but when you enter the value, it's just entered into the field. It's not added to the list. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it would be really interesting if there was a way, having entered a value into a drop-down field, uh, to have a little button that says, you know, make this and uh, add this to the list, and it would create the appropriate uh, uh, tiddler under the uh, under the data slash types. Yeah. I mean, you could imagine maybe this drop-down could have two tabs. One that's the um, list of sort of cherry-picked types that Tiddlers exist for, and another tab that shows all of the type fields across all of the Tiddlers um, in the wiki, so that you could pick an existing one without having to have a, um, a, a Tiddler describing it. Ah, I see. Yeah, and I was suggesting even further, which was that you could just type a value in, and that would then create the appropriate tiddler, so that it would become a, a first-class member of the list. You could imagine indeed doing that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'll show you how that how it's done, and it's pretty hairy at the moment. And as usual, it's partly hairy because um, of the line breaks in it. So um, let me. Actually, let me shut a whole load of these. That's me needing to tidy up after a week's coding and not closing any tabs. Um, so I was going to show you the... So here in the edit template, um, when we added the type drop-down, we added one new tiddler, this guy, which um, contains the type editor. So let's um, break it down. The um, first thing is the top part um, is the text box um, and um, the drop-down um, triangle, so those things. And this part is the actual um, drop down. So there's two independent parts of this tiddler. They, um, <coughs> within reason, they could be somewhere else. So then, if we look at the top part, 
um, first of all, we've got a simple prompt. Then we've got um, a rather complicated edit text widget. And then we're invoking a button widget with an image in it. And for reasons that I don't quite recall, the whole lot's wrapped up in a paragraph tag. So the edit text field is um, editing the field type. And so because there's no tiddler attribute specified, it'll be editing the type field of the current tiddler. It's probably not necessary, but we say give us um, an HTML input element to edit this field um, rather than the text area, but it wouldn't give you a text area. We set a blank default value, um, a placeholder, and then there's this guy, focus pop-up. Well, that's um, an attribute on the edit text widget that, if present, causes the specified state tiddler to be set whenever the edit text control receives focus. Um, and you can see that the tiddler title is specified via the qualify macro. What that means is that the title, which starts off like that, will have appended on it um, some other strings that will make sure that it is unique. And you'll see, jumping ahead, that down here there's a reveal widget that references the same title. So it may just be worth having a quick look in here to see that. So if we open the system tab, you can see the type drop-down tiddler is here. Um, Annoyingly, okay, so right now you, you can almost see it that the tiddler at the moment contains some coordinates. If I um, get rid of the drop down by clicking on the triangle, you can see that tiddler loses its value. Um, and if I go in and edit that with any luck, yeah, that should make the drop down appear. Does that make sense? So we've got a tiddler there that it started off with the title um, state type drop down. It gets all of this stuff appended to it, which means that it's unique if if we had two tiddlers open in edit mode, dropping down the um, uh, dropping down the list for one wouldn't drop down the list for another. Does that make sense? So I can show you a couple of things that might make that clearer. Um, well, the thing that we, that's, if I, if I get rid of the qualify, no, that's not, that's not, let's keep just looking at it. Okay, so that was, that was the edit widget, yes, and so the only unusual thing about it is this um, focus pop-up. And then um, this button widget is the down arrow, that triangle, and um, the, we're using the button widget in pop-up mode, which means that it puts pop-up coordinates or toggles pop-up coordinates in the specified state tiddler when the button is clicked. Does that all look good? Um, so now down here, this is where we do the actual drop-down. So we've got a reveal widget, and its state um, is pointing to the same state tiddler that's being referenced in the edit text widget and the button widget. So here we're saying reveal, um, show the contents of the reveal widget only if that tiddler does not match the empty string. So that means whenever anybody types into the, whenever that, um, uh, whenever there is a value in that state tiddler, then it will show the drop down content. And we've got a bit of CSS to make the thing um, look like a drop down. Um, and then there's this link catcher widget, um, which is also uh, used um, for theme switching. What this does is it catches navigation attempts from the content within it. So the content within it is that list widget at the moment. Um, and it intercepts any navigation attempts. And instead of navigating to that tiddler, it stores it in the specified text reference. And the specified text reference here doesn't include a tiddler. 
it just includes the um, a field specifier saying put it in the type field. So that means this link catcher will take the text of any link that's clicked on within its content and it will put it into the type field of the current tiddler. Does that make sense? And then now the we're really... Any link? <clears throat> the text of any link meaning just uh, the part that's the whole... The, the title, the the part. The that we, the, so, so in fact, if I break this next bit down, so you, the list is kind of the easy bit. This is the guy that just um, uh, so it goes through both shadow and non-shadow tiddlers that have the prefix docs slash types, sorts it by the description, and then for each of the entries in that list, we render a link to the name, and you'll remember. That the name field, um, I've lost the. The name field is the actual MIME type. Um, and then the. We view the description um, with the name in brackets. And the bang bang? Um, and the bang bang here is because that's a text reference. Um, oh. And okay. so it's saying. Uh, which, which is, I mean, you, you, your question puts puts your finger on something that I'm beginning to see might start to get a bit confusing. Um, <clears throat> that there's um, for in some situations you're identifying a text reference and you've got the double bang, and in some situations you're just identifying a tiddler title and double bang doesn't have the same meaning. So up above where you have the bang bang type on the link catcher two field. Yes, so that's, um, oh, I didn't turn off my, there we go. Um, uh, so that's saying um, store um, any clicked, any link that is navigated to into the type field of current tiddler. And what if it didn't have bang bang, if it just said type? Then, then it would be doing it to a tiddler called type. Ah, so the bang bang points it to the particular field? Yes, it's what's called a text reference. So in um, there, are, uh, there's some docs about it here. Um, oh, oh, there would be if I could type it correctly. So text reference is a general purpose way of referring to a chunk of text, and you can use any of these four syntaxes, which would probably be more clearly, more clearer to read if I put them in a table, actually. But either a naked tiddler title, um, a title and a field specifier, just a field specifier, or a title and a property index, which is for getting stuff out of data tiddlers. So in that case, where you have the tiddler titer, tiddler, little that, tiddler title and the metadata field, you've got bang bangs there, it looks like, uh, and the hash marks down for if it's a property value. Yeah. So the meta field, then, that actually has to be one of the things that's defined as as an actual field part of the tiddler, whereas the other is just one of the, uh, uh, there's a couple of different ways to do the properties, I think, That's within right. the actual body of the tiddler. Okay. That's exactly correct, yeah. Um, and, and if you, in the various places where we're referencing um, text references here, the link catcher, it'll create the field if necessary. Um, and link to... Um, It would just return a blank link if the name field didn't exist. Okay. So, Jeremy, the um, the link to isn't really truly being. It's not necessarily even a tiddler title. It's any value. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. So, so basically, the uh, the text that's displayed is the description field, and the value of the item is the link value. That's right, yeah. Okay, is there a uh, tooltip ability? There isn't. I mean, this, this generates an anchor tag. So, um, as things stand, um, I could um, put a uh, span or a div around it. So oh, it. and then have the title on that. Yeah. Okay. But, um, okay, because that's, that's a fairly uh, common thing to do in a list box. Yes. Yeah. is to have a, a tooltip explaining the value. Yeah, I mean, well, you can see that what I tried to do was... Um, I mean, in, in this particular drop list, it's it's not necessarily that useful. No, exactly, because, because, because you're, picking a, you're picking the value itself. 
Well, and I've done it the other way around too, where we've got oh, I the see. description and then the values in brackets. Now, is that that's the description text includes both the words and the the value yeah. in, in the text, so so, so that's redundant. Yeah, it's going back to here how we've got a a view um, a view widget for the description field and for the name field. Right now, would it be possible since the um, the 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 um, the actual MIME type is the name field. Would it be possible instead to instead of putting it in the description, uh, automatically append it so it'd be you know, the description plus the name field in parens as part of the display? Uh, sorry, can you ask that question again? I'm not sure if I'm um, you're doing a view of the description field. Suppose yeah. the description field didn't include the MIME type in parentheses. It doesn't. No, he's got it listed as a separate piece there. There's two. Oh, I see it. There. I see it. Yo, dur, dur. Okay, now I see it. I didn't for some reason I didn't see it on your screen. Now I do. One of yes, the it's exactly that added, that's exactly what I was talking about. One of the things I've added recently, which I'm not using everywhere, is that now the view widget has this extremely neat feature where um, it displays the content of the widget if the field you specified doesn't exist. So it kind of lets you do a fallback. Um, so what that means is that you could, for instance, do something like this, where it tries to display the description field, but if it doesn't have the description field, then we'll show the title field. Does that make sense? So let's just say inside one view widget, we've got another view widget. So you've got this Which kind acts of as a fallback. Exactly. Now is, now, is that if the field doesn't exist or if the field value is blank? Can't remember. Um, I did one or the other. Um, yeah, if it's blank or missing. Okay, so, so it's either then. Yeah, and either that, way, that was intentional because um, uh, blank values uh, are useful. So, Did you imply that if you gave a span around there that would automatically put up a tooltip, or were you just suggesting that as a path of attaching a tooltip? To that, that would be a way of giving it a tooltip, a not great way, but a way. But it would do it automatically with just that? Well, HTML would do it for us. Yeah, but, okay. but that would yeah, I mean that would be a boring old HTML style tooltip. Does that make sense? Yeah. I so I, what, one of the things to say at this point is um, I mentioned this a couple of times in the group is that we need to over the course of the beta start figuring out what the common idioms are and make them easier to do. Um, and uh, tooltips um, would be a case in point, except that tooltips are more complicated because I want to be able to support rich tooltips, so not just the browser's little yellow ribbons, but um, you know proper previews and so on within tooltips. Um, but there's a bunch of stuff here that really um, could be very easily packaged up as macros. I mean, in fact, I think this whole caboodle is useful enough um, that um, the, the whole thing should be made into a macro, but some of the elements within it, um, likewise. And you can see how... You know, if you wanted, that's the filter of things that get shown. Um, and obviously those, the titles have to refer to the title of a type descriptor tiddler, or whatever we call those things. Um, but uh, it could be, you can see how the technique is quite flexible. We could specify that filter in lots of different ways, in lots of different filter criteria. And we could use the same technique as well to add a um, oh, go away um, to to add a drop down to this as well, so it could drop down all of the um, again the field names that are in use in the current document, and you may remember that up here there's also documentation tiddlers about the fields, so we could also list them along with a human readable description. Yeah. 
I'll accept pull requests for that. Okay, so I think that that was um, what what I wanted to cover, just to hopefully answer Joshua's question. I'm now going to undo all of those changes so that we go back to how it was and don't accidentally change the production copy to the wiki file. Um, any questions on that? Um, have I let everybody in? Yes. Okay, so then the next thing that we were going to talk about was Dave's question. Um, so now this was, I'll put a link to it here. Um, so Dave's original question um, uh, actually takes some unpacking. Um, so the first thing is that uh, Dave's asking, Dave's trying to do stuff in wiki text and finding it clumsy and saying, is there a better way to do this? And Dave, please continue to do that because, as I say, that's a big goal now. Um, now that we've got uh, lots of the internals settled down, we need to try and make sure that the wiki text is right. So this is absolutely the kind of conversation that I would love to be having now. Um, and it's incredibly useful to see, um, you know, what you're doing and to get your feedback because it, it helps as ever um, push me in the right direction. So the first thing is that I um, your your comment. I mean, your question is in terms of um, doing transclusions within tables. Now I think we really, really, really need a new table syntax. So at the moment, um, is there a there is even documentation on the table syntax, but I'm sure you're all familiar with it anyway. But um, the table syntax is kind of um, not skeuomorphic. I'm not sure what the word is. Well, maybe it is. Maybe skeuomorphic will work. But um, the markup is designed to look like a table. Um, and um, that does look good for um, small, simple tables. But if I uh, go to... I don't know, Dave, perhaps you've got some um, good examples. So if we look at some table stuff. Um, yes, this kind of thing. Ah, well, those ones are quite neat. That was quite neat, too. So, Dave, I was looking for an example of a complicated hairy table, and I didn't find one here. But um, the media wiki has a multi-line table syntax, um, and I think we need to adopt it, adopt one as well. So this would be a way of typing tables um, where, for instance, we'd go, well, actually, let's look at the media wiki. And I keep, oh, yeah, media wiki table syntax. So it sort of unrolls the table to make it more like a, here we go, um, to make it more like a list. So um, that um, says start of table. Um, that, a vertical bar at the beginning of the line, says start of cell. That says is a row separator. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that one's exactly right but it's not bad um, it um, you know lots of our existing wiki text syntax is stuff that you have to have at the start of the line so it seems not bad um, the it precludes you having a single dash in the table cell that doesn't seem too bad um, it uses curly braces which I'm not sure that that really kind of um, matches anything in Tiddly wiki 5 though I'd wondered about a um, using double vertical bars, um, but it seems a bit mean to make people use double vertical bars all the way down when it's really just a way of of making the top one clearer. Um, I think 
that would probably be my sort of um, uh, uh, paper tiger proposal. What do you think? Hmm. The thing that would the thing that would be good and interesting is that you would also be able to do things like this. Um, So do you see what I did? I added a div to the end of that row. Um, and certainly if I implemented the syntax in the default way, that entire chunk would be considered to be part of the table cell. Um, and the reason is because we've started a new piece of wiki syntax um, before the line break. So it's going to carry on parsing to the end of the div before it starts looking for the line break that says I'm the end of the table cell. Would you keep your old um, or the current table syntax? Yes. So um, it would be. So, a the, so the double um, vertical bar at the beginning would clash with the syntax because this could as well be just one cell of uh, one empty cell of a table. Uh, yes, um, it would. It would stop you having a um, ordinary table with one blank cell at the top. But you wouldn't, would you? <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I don't think you would. I mean, um, I, I, no, I mean, let's have a look. But I, does it even get? <laughs> would that be any different than if you had a vertical bar space vertical bar so that you had a, a empty cell but it actually had a blank space in it? Well, if you had a blank space, that seems more like, yeah, that looks to me like a valid table. Um, right. Well, I mean, you could do that if, if you were worried about the double bar conflicting and you really wanted an empty cell, you could, you could put the, oh, instead yeah, of yeah. the two vertical yeah. bars now, you could put the space. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I think I feel very strongly about this wiki text stuff that it's impossible to make wiki text syntax that does everything. And so the art of it is we've got to keep choosing for the 80% of cases. So there'll always be edge cases that, you know, wanting to have tiddler titles with double square brackets in, that kind of stuff that's tricky. Um, and in the case of wiki, wiki text syntax, um, people can always drop down to HTML if they really need to. It's not beautiful, but um, I'd rather that a few people had to do that than that everybody had to cope with you know, a more complex syntax. There's not a generic way of like escaping a character to allow it to be interpreted as a raw character. Like a backslash. No. no. That would be the common way to do it in, 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 in Linux. You know, if you're something where you're... So what problem are we something. trying to solve? We, we already discussed it. Remember? The tilde as an escape character. Well, the, the, I think, I think that, that was... The, the t yeah, the tilde was, was similar, but um, maybe, maybe what um, you're suggesting here is even... Um, is different, I'm not sure. Um, but the... Uh, but no, I mean, I'm, I'm not hugely in favor of escaping mechanisms because it's a bit programmery. And one of the things that keeps recurring is that um, if we answer certain design questions in certain ways, we will end up reinventing AngularJS's template syntax. Um, and, and, you know, the purpose of TillyWiki is, is more towards um, serving the needs of end users, you know, who couldn't use Angular, if you see what I mean. Or, 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 right. Um, I was just suggesting that that would be an alternative to uh, just throwing out the 20%. You address the 80%, they get it easy, but the 20% that they're trying to do something a little bit odd, there's at least a mechanism, even if it's a yes. little cumbersome, that allows them to do it. Yes, and and, and, and I'm very, f sorry, I, I'm, um, I was coming across as, as disagreeing when I think actually we're agreeing in chorus. So I um, very much agree with that principle, but I think the 20% the, the escape route is often to fall back to HTML. Um, okay. and, that, and that's the thing that really frees us up to make the Wikitech syntax expressive. Um, so it's interesting also if I, uh, oh no, it doesn't take any of it, I suppose. Um, so going back to Dave's question, that that's really, Dave, my most helpful answer um, is that you're um, constrained by the present syntax to be trying to do stuff that's kind of impossible. The present syntax only allows you to have 
inline mode content within a table cell and um, you're trying to put block mode content in there. Um, so, but I was also interested to see this bit, Dave. You say tables in TW5 work one way and transclusions work a different way. And so transclusion with any specificity can't work in, right inside table cells. And I wasn't quite sure. I wanted to make sure that I'd understood what you meant there, Dave. Um, I think I meant, uh, no, let me think here. Well, the tables that, uh, you know, if you, for table cell, you can't have a space because it breaks the table cell. But then uh, if you put a, like, for example, the, the tech thing that's down below, um, inside of there, it gives it problems. Or like uh, the list filters and things like that, if you need some spaces in there, then it doesn't quite work. Okay, so it sounds like you might be finding bugs that I'm not aware of. Uh, no, just that the table cell, need, if you add a space, then it breaks the table cell. But for some of the list filter things, you know, you need... Uh, you need to have spaces in them for them to work. So in what way does the table get broken by putting spaces in it? So um, you mean if I try and put this inside a table cell, it breaks? Uh, you've helped me with a few things through the Google group where you said, yeah, but that has to be on a new line because uh, um, it won't work if it's not on a new line. Right, yes, yeah, so there's... there's um, new line... The Okay, so good. I think we are on the same page. That's the thing where in order to trigger, to flip certain operations into block mode, you need a new line afterwards, and you can't have a new line when you're within the table cell. So yeah, that, 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 that's the fundamental problem that is fixed by the expanded table syntax. Um, Would be fixed. So then, uh, and then you're asking about... Um, uh, optional formatting, and I just wanted to be clear that, of course, if you're using the list widget directly, then all of the formats that you mentioned um, can be done um, with appropriate templates. Does that make sense? Say again. Um, uh, all of those, all of these examples of how you want the output of the list filter, uh, list widget to appear. They can all be done, um, but with appropriate templates. Um, could you show me that? I'm not quite sure. How so if we take, you're saying that you'd like to be able to, for the list, when you do a uh, transcluded list, that you'd like to be able to select an ordered list, an unordered list, a comma-separated list, bullets, mm -hmm. etc. So I'll show you how we do those. Um, so... Right, so there's a simple list widget that's um, giving me all of the um, Tiddler's Tag task in alphabetical order, yeah. Um, and um, at the moment, um, it's in block mode because the list widget is the first thing on the line and it's followed by a new line. So if I put a full stop after it, for instance, and click done, now everything is on one line because it's no longer in block mode, it's in inline mode. Does that, 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 that's the bit that we've talked about before, Dave. So yeah. now let's try giving it a template where, so to give it a template, we close the widget explicitly and I've added a view widget to list the title field, and we'll put a comma after it. So now we've got a comma-separated list, um, and the list items are no longer linked. And the reason why is because we've our template is just that. It only includes the view field. If we want to make it be a link, then we have to do that explicitly. So we'll say link to... and we'll wrap that around the view widget. Um, and we're going to 
review the title, uh, we're going to link to the title field. So now, ooh, Jeremy's typed something wrong. What did I do wrong? Oh, so it's the, as link instead of list. I don't know if you saw that. Okay, so now um, we've. Jeremy's made another mistake. Bear with me. So I said link to title, and I should have said link to the contents of the title field. So now those links are working again. So what what was going on there was that. To begin with, the simple version of the list, and let's put a horizontal rule in and then just add back the simple version. So, so without a template, it gives us a default template that just views the title of each tiddler through a link so that we get, we get the familiar default behavior of a list of titles that we can click on. Up here, we're specifying a custom template. And because we might not want the items in the template to be links, we have to manually create the links. Does that make sense? Um, and now, say if we don't want them to be all on one line, the reason for that is because we were in inline mode because there's no new line after the opening tag. If I now add those line breaks in, then uh, we get the guys on each, uh, on each separate line. You'll notice that we've got a paragraph tag, and that's because it classes that as a paragraph um, and wraps a p tag around it. That's the over-eager paragraph generation that we need to fix. Um, and if we, the workaround um, is to put a div around it like that. Yeah. And then you get the same spacing as below. So now, Dave, you're asking about ULs and LIs. So if we want a UL, we put the UL tag outside the list, and we make the template include, well, in this case, LI. So now we've got a bulleted list. So, Jeremy, I have a uh, uh, Hangout documentation question. Mm -hmm. uh, as someone who's gone back and tried to, you know, catch up on some of the things I've missed and look through the videos and stuff, uh, often the screenshots and the screen shares that are here are sort of mostly visible, but, you know, they're really hard to get exactly with the TiddlyWiki syntax exactly what's on there. And I've often wished that there was a place that, you know, sort of the example tiddlers that were gone through in the yeah. Hangout could save somewhere as a, temporary, you know, hanging out tiddlers, you know, such and such, where someone could at least go through and look at, you know, maybe one version. It wouldn't have to be every single edit, but something that would contain the gist of, uh, like, what you were just doing, where you have the two different lists and you have that saved. They could at least have something to go back and refer to, uh, you know, in hard text form. Uh, yes, that would be extremely useful. Um, I, I guess there's a couple of things that we could do. I, I could for every Hangout, create a new tiddly spot wiki that contains um, the things that I type during that Hangout. That would be possibly quite handy. The other thing I could do is copy things like that and paste them into here. Yeah, that would be good. That would be good. Um, so maybe, maybe for the moment... Oh, Mario, hi, you're back. Um, that and you're not shown in the broadcast. Is there a, has anybody else arrived who's not been shown? Ah, okay. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Mary. I'm so sorry. We we're okay. putting you on. Um, everybody has to be approved before they're allowed to join because of the problems last week. Ah, okay. I didn't, because I was busy screen sharing, I didn't get to see you. Um, no, no, no problem. Uh, so one of the things that we've just talked about, we we're just going through this list stuff, um, and um, we we're just covering off the fact that we're tending to lose things that I'm typing here. So I'm just rescuing a couple of things. This is the 
proposed syntax for multi-line lists, um, uh, which is merged together with the previous example slightly unhelpfully. Um, okay. I'm, I'm wondering how we would um, include the center or uh, right align the same. Oh, that's an interesting one. That's a very the good point. Well, we could, making it up, we could do that kind of thing. But I wonder how you do center. Let's see what MediaWiki does. That would be interesting. Um, Ooh, a line equals left. Okay, that's not bad. Exclamation mark instead of pipe for headings. Caption's got a plus. That looks like a pretty good option. Gosh, do you see this? A line equals right. <laughs> um, that that seems not that beautiful. Um, look at uh, look at. Can you see this example here? Yeah. So there's a table with the right hand column right aligned, and that's pretty ropey, isn't it? The fact that I really don't like the fact that the formatting. To me, it looks like it's on kind of the same level as the text, if you see what I mean. I'd mm -hmm. prefer the formatting to look like it was bracketed or so in some way sort of um, demarcated from the text a little better. But uh, Jeremy, Hello. Uh, the, the in normal cases with TDWiki lists and this stuff are, are created by uh, filters. And, and how, how would you create a dynamic table? So, uh, because this is this is all uh, let's say hard coded, which is which is nice. Yes, yes. And yes. if you want to have multi-line content, it is great. Mm. Uh, but in most of the cases, uh, you want to have uh, dynamic um, tables, where you have uh, let's say list filters. Mm. Well, that's um, that, that's a very good point. Um, before moving to that, I'll just note in passing um, that. We need to figure out a way to do center, right, etc. Um, in our table syntax, because this is pretty hideous, I think. Okay, and your point about um, wanting to create a table um, with the um, with a transcluded list, um, yes, absolutely. So we need a new syntax for that, I think. So um, at the moment, we've got that guy. Takes a filter, and is is it double pipe before the template? I can't remember. Um, yeah, I think that's right. Um, oh, it won't be in the. We can take some wiki ducks too. Yes, it is. Forgive me for not updating that very. Ooh. It's quite weird when it does when it highlights things inside the um, text area. Um, so yes, we need a new syntax for tables and lists. So I'd wondered about if we take lists first. Um, I just wondered about that if there was so in other words. If the first, uh, if the first item in a lit, um, if you get triple open curly braces immediately after the marker of the start of a list, then generate um, list elements. Sorry, I haven't explained that well at all. What's what? What I'm is what I'd really like to be able to do is see is this kind of thing.
so that the table, sorry, that the list contains Do you see what I mean? It yep. contains both manual entries and automatically generated entries. And I think that would be terrific for yep. writing navigation. This would be really cool, yeah. Um, the, and let's just paste that in. To the Hangout. Oh, look. And the Hangout seems to have completely mangled it by doing something else with the um, asterisks. But the in a tiddler somewhere. <laughs> I'm so sorry. You may have to store those things in a real tiddler somewhere. Yes, yes, uh, that would be a good deal more efficient. <laughs> I do apologize. Uh, well, I guess I can save this. I, I won't. Anyway. Um, so does that make sense? And and then if we did that, you know, a single one, um, that would just generate um, a ULLI, and I guess. We'd also need OL by doing that. Mm -hmm. yeah, that that's syntax. And, and, like, and if you and if you start with a with a pipe, it creates a, a table. Um, let's see how that looks. Picking <laughs> up wiki text syntax. As yeah, we the, the problem the problem with tables is that most of the cases you have you have to specify columns and rows. Yeah, exactly. So, exactly. Uh, and and and. But yeah. the thing, I mean, if we look at a table, a transcluded table, um, for an example, and let's go into here to do that, maybe. Um, uh, yeah, so here's here's my list of plugins in the control panel. Um, and we've got, we've got the table element and the t-body element outside the list filter. We've also got an additional row above the list filter um, of the table. Um, and so there's a, there's, it seems as though that's redundant. As soon as the list widget knows that it's generating a table, then it can generate the table wrapper. The complication there is what if maybe if they want to have additional rows of the table, maybe they would need to drop back to HTML syntax. Um, and then within here, yeah, we need a nicer syntax for the rows, which you'd think we could we could allow either of the existing wiki text table row syntaxes to be used, you would think, wouldn't you? So I guess maybe we'd be looking at Okay, so these are filtered lists. And these are filtered tables. So that's what we got so far. We know basically we're going to need to have an opener, an opening, and a closing to it because we want to be able to do things like this, don't we? Um, so again, I'm sure I'd be making the fonts bigger, but I don't know if that's clear. But the that's saying. Ignore that bit. That's saying that would be a reasonable way of describing a row of a table. So now for this syntax, we need to wrap it up in something. So we could either, we could again adopt the double guy to say that's the start of a filtered table. And that's its end. And in between there is a template. Uh, yeah, is, uh, uh, but then we'd need a way to distinguish the inline syntax versus that syntax. But I mean, now this is now starting to look a bit hairy because we've got triple curly braces there, double curly braces there. They do kind of mean the same thing. That's still a transclusion, and that's still a filtered transclusion. So you know what I what I was getting. This transclusion syntax is very common using double um, curly braces for transclusion, and I thought triple for filtered was a nice sort of extension of that. 
a more and, intense type of transclusion. And, and if we wrap it with a, with a macro, so that there is something like a table macro that can handle this this stuff. Yes, that would certainly um, would certainly hope. But I mean, I think the table, you know, wiki text syntax is supposed to be easy enough to type that you would type it directly. Macros are supposed to save us from the complexities of widgets, and not really about saving us from the complexity. Of yeah, wiki text syntax because yeah, <laughs> this is this is really really complicated already. So if you it is, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And and, and some, table... some some of the complications, I do think you know, we because it's very difficult in Tilly Wiki Five at the moment to include white space that can make stuff look you know um, ridiculously complicated. Um, and it would, you know, if you could mix in lots of line breaks and comments and so on, it might be a bit easier to handle. But it's a tricky one because the, you know, I'm not, I'm not even sure. I, I, I mean, I, I think a filtered table, um, it may, they may not be that common, you know. I mean, we all we all need them when we're thinking about things like building. Um, yeah, you can. Uh, but what you can do is uh, create just create a bulleted list and assign some uh, <laughs> yeah. to it and, and, and let it look like a table. So this would be possible too. <laughs> That's also true. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, yeah. look, but let's just keep going a bit. Look, what, so what we're saying here with the filtered table syntax. One of the problems is that it's just too fiddly. So I think that. Um, and, and don't forget that it's saving us from an enormous amount of complexity. So a syntax for a filtered table, it, it can still be quite complicated and yet be simpler than doing it um, in raw HTML like this. Do you see what I mean? So what I'm suggesting is that maybe the problem with this is that this um, a filtered table is a complicated thing. A filtered table needs to be easy to remember it doesn't need to be easy to type in the sense of being the minimum number of characters, which we might feel was a you know was a useful characteristic of the manual table syntax, for instance. So it makes me wonder whether there's a scope for a more kind of um, explicit syntax that we can use for lots more complicated things. So, for instance, you could do you could have this. So, okay, so that that is a general thing saying um, a new thing started, and we'll just give it a name. So that's that we'd we'd use this maybe for lots of things. Um, yeah, and then have something at, to end it with. What could end it? Yeah. So that I don't mind. That is no, nice, clear start and end. Um, it's not recreating HTML because this is line break based. You know, but the HTML syntax is very fussy in terms of having slashes and so on because it doesn't use line breaks syntactically. But by using line breaks syntactically, we've made the syntax a wee bit simpler. Yeah, and how would you go on then? So let, let's define a row in the in the column. And well, that, that's sticking with the idea that we're trying to make it sort of general. Maybe the row would be here, um, and cells would be like that. Oh, there's a row with no cells in it. That's not very helpful. Okay, so 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 now all I've done so far is reinvented the table syntax because it still doesn't have any of the filter stuff on it. But we could now. But uh, I can't I can't imagine how this table will look like.
So the advantage of the existing syntax is that uh, the uh, imagination is easy. Yes, yeah, so you're talking about the skeuomorphism, but we've already established yeah. that skeuomorphism breaks down. If the contents of the table is complicated, it no longer looks like a table. And we've got cases like this where we can't even use the Wikitext table syntax. So um, this, I take your point that this is less readable than the existing syntax, but we need something that's different than the existing syntax because the existing syntax isn't solving all our problems. So I mean, so I don't, I don't know that this is very good at all, but um, uh, I think now you could imagine something as simple as this. Yeah. So all, all we've needed to do is say I'm a table um, and I'm made on a filter um, and then we need a separator between each cell of the table. Yeah, and you need the heading. But then maybe this can just be made to be... Yeah, but then we go back to... So I don't know if this... I don't, I'm not sure about this idea, but you see what I'm trying to do is is... If we're going to create a more verbose syntax, can we create the more verbose syntax for filtered tables in a way that uses rules and conventions that we can use in other places? I mean, and in fact, comparing the top and bottom, there's very little difference. But look, that versus yeah. that. I, I think I think the second one is, is is easier to read. But it only makes sense to say if we are going to reuse a syntax like that. So anyway, let me put that into there. Let's see what mess it makes of it. Um, there's another one as well, which is when we transclude, um, if I We need a syntax for typed transclusion. So at the moment, if I transclude hello there, it will parse hello there as a Wikitext tiddler. Um, and uh, then it will display it rendered. Now, that has turned out to be. Um, let me show you. So back here, this is the um, place where I'm doing the. Which is that the most? So I'm so sorry, guys. Let me find a simpler example. Um, Yeah, I think this is sort of simpler. This is the tabs macro, which you'll recall is currently defined in the page macros tiddler. It really should be somewhere else. But there's a kind of weird call here, macro call saying um, invoke the macro called current tab, interpret its type as text plane and its output as text plane. And the reason for that is so the alternative, the simpler alternative would have been and if I just put, just putting line breaks in so you can see, I could have put that. But the difference is that that would have wikified the contents of that macro. Whereas here, by saying interpret it as plain text and output it in plain text, it doesn't wikify it. So if I'd left it like that, it means that. Um, tabs whose um, caption was the wiki text link would be rendered as a wiki text link, for instance. So what it's making me think is that actually it would be incredibly useful to be able to stipulate the type um, in the transclusion. So I don't know, that kind of thing. That's a very daft example. Um, 
yeah, some magic separator. And I think we need it with transclusion as well. So, uh, guys, I don't know, maybe this is, um, th th this might be a bit too frustrating to do much more of this because, um, you know, I'm trying to come up with ideas in a group, it's difficult, but I've hopefully given you a flavor of um, the areas that I'm starting to think about. As I say, I don't think this stuff is massively threatening. I think we need to get this right over the course of the beta. Um, but the, I guess the big takeaway is the thing that, Dave's just said this back. It's the, the big takeaway, Dave, is to start thinking, everybody, start thinking of TiddlyWiki5 wiki text as being fluid and plastic. This is a really good time to make changes. This is um, a good moment to complain if there's things that you find yourself typing all the time that are clumsy and awkward. Um, what I plan to do is to create a ticket called um, Cleaning Up Wiki Text or something. Um, where we can just pile in some of the ideas and suggestions rather than making a whole load of um, different tickets, first of all. Um, Stefan's just posted here um, an interesting example of extending the table syntax that we talked about. Just paste it in here so that you can see. So Stefan's added a header indicator, left and right aligned. Oh, numerically aligned. Yes, I don't know if that, I don't think that is entirely possible, but that's. Oh, ooh, how interesting! I have a horrible feeling we may need. Ooh, may need to hack that, but I do see that would be incredibly handy. Uh, and this is a classed table. Okay, with the um, tilde escape. That makes sense. No, um, if I remember the site correctly, the tilde is for the end of the row, correct? The what, sir? The pipe tilde is for the end of the row, right? Ah. And this should then be uh, a classed row. Unfortunately, it's at the end of the row. Because oh, we, don't, we don't have a marker for the beginning of the row. I see, I see. Yes, that's not bad. I quite like the way that the formatting is all pocketed away inside the... OK. It's pocketed away inside the vertical bars. Anyway, look, um, I, th I suggest that we um, put this to one side now as not being too pressing. And I'll turn to, I think, the remaining um, agenda item we had at the beginning, which was, I think, again, Stefan asking about um, what happens, e.g., when the save button is clicked. So I think, Stefan, you were, you were asking, or I could interpret this question in two levels. There's, there's, in general, how do you find out things like that, like what happens when the save button is clicked? And then there's perhaps the specific about the actual save button. Uh, so the answer um, to the first part is um, one figures out what happens by clicking when you click on the save button by understanding the entire TiddlyWiki code and <laughs> knowing how it all fits together. <laughs> um, <coughs> the other way um, is probably for me to walk through it. So I think um, really... Un the way that you're phrasing the question, is, it's kind of as, the, as if understanding a flow like that, like what happens if you press the save button, is a good way to learn how TiddlyWiki5 works and a good way to sort of learn one's way around the code. Uh, tell me, there has been, there has been in the, in the um, let's say, I don't know, at the very first uh, Hangouts, there has been some discussion about the entry points for starting to debug with uh, Leo. So maybe... Uh, maybe this will be a point too. With so, Leo? Uh, 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 when, when Leo was the second time there, we had, a, a dis uh, I think, a very good discussion about the different entry points mm -hmm. um, for, for inserting a breakpoint and then goes through the whole text, uh, through the whole uh, program. Uh, I think it would be worth uh, a look for Stefan. 
Yes, uh, okay, I, okay. I, I can't remember the, the, the Hangout. No. But this is uh, a very special case, what Tina wants to know. But um, hopefully you annotated it. <laughs> yes, I um, did. <laughs> okay, so let's. So, so I'm going to answer that question first, which is, what's the best way of reading the TiddlyWiki source code, TiddlyWiki 5 source code? Um, and um, for me, the answer, I think, is fairly... Oops. Sorry, clicking on the wrong things, butter fingers, fat fingers. Um, it's actually fairly easy that you start with the boot kernel. So um, the boot kernel in the TiddlyWiki 5 repo is in its own folder. It consists of uh, a handful of tiddlers, boot prefix, which goes first, um, and contains, as you can see, like 100 lines that does a little bit of setup. Um, then there's um, the boot kernel itself, which is now, I think, more like 1,000 lines, 1,500 lines, including lots and lots of comments. Now, the reason why this is a good place to start is that the boot kernel is completely self-contained. Its job is to load enough of the TiddlyWiki environment that plugins can be loaded. And you will recall, um, oh, I don't really want to clear that, uh, let's go here instead. Use that. Um, you'll recall that uh, when I look at the plugins list, that the core is itself a plugin, so and it's a big one. And so that's where all the shadow tiddlers live. So um, that means that um, inside the boot kernel, um, well, if I go right to the end, you can see where it actually, how it actually starts up. So it calls this boot function, um, which uh, is asynchronous, because if the user has to enter a password to decrypt the tiddlers, um, then um, it'll invoke that callback when the user um, has correctly entered the password, and then calls the startup routine, which is this guy here. So this is, you know, what you'd expect really, a very straightforward plod through all the things that need to be initialized. So um, it's a you know it's a couple of hours work, but I would say read through boot.js um, as your as the first starting point. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd say it was it's reasonably well commented. Um, so certainly you should be able to at least figure out um, name the landscape as you go through it, even though it'll probably take a couple of runs to um, completely understand all of it. Um, anyway, as I say, a goal of the uh, of the boot kernel is for it to be as short as small as possible, but it turns out it has to do a fair amount of stuff. So, I mean, for instance, all that decryption stuff, loading tiddlers from the DOM, loading in the, on the server, all the stuff about loading tiddlers from the file system, all of that needs to be in the boot kernel. And then once you got to grips with the boot kernel, um, then it's a matter just of working one's way through the modules that comprise the TiddlyWiki core. So within the core folder in the TiddlyWiki 5 repo, these are all of the tiddlers that um, form the main core plugin. So you can see here a plugin info file that gives information about it as a plugin. Um, and when you go into the modules folder, you'll see that the majority of the modules that make up TiddlyWiki 5 fall into those seven categories. So there's a seven different module types, and then there's down here, there's whatever it is, nine or so loose modules that um, don't fall into um, categories so neatly. And the most important one is startup.js. Um, that's got the module type startup, which means the boot kernel invokes it immediately after boot up. And so it's this guy that does things like render the page template. So if I go down here, this part. Here we're rendering the template, core UI page macros, and all the shenanigans we have to do to get that into the DOM and to get it to refresh itself when there's a change. Um, I would also, uh, in terms of understanding the TiddlyWiki code, oh gosh, sorry, um, would also remind you that on here there's quite a lot of internal docs. 
So I'm going to move these off into a separate dev wiki, but things like the description of the boot mechanism, um, the description of how encryption works, these guys will give you the kind of bird's eye view that will hopefully help the code to make sense. So for instance, the stuff about plugins, this is where it records what the actual um, requirements are for a plugin to be a plugin. So the, the code related to plugins is a lot easier to read once you've had a quick look at that. Does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Much to do. There's, but, um, I mean, it's, it's I, I one hope, of. I, I hope I could um, somehow start the uh, <coughs> uh, fire. No, not Firefox. What's it called? Uh, it, Firebug. Mm, Firebug. Correct. Uh, click there and can uh, trace through to see which yeah. functions are called, and uh, then look into those. You can do it that way. I mean, personally, I'm not a great fan of tracing through. Tracing through code, but yeah, for sure you could. Um, because because it's easier to spot the place where uh, changes could could be made. Yeah. Um, Jeremy, no, but if that if that's an approach that suits you, um, there's certainly you can do that. Jeremy, where is the where is the code that catches uh, the messages? Because the button the button sends a message from the. Well, so should should we should we step through the save button now? Uh, with that yeah. introduction. I think it would be interesting. So yeah, I think so too. So, so, so th um, but, but it, was, it was worth covering that first bit just to say this is, you know, to get to the point where you've got the kind of understanding of the code somebody like Mario has, you need to probably do both. We'll need to go through a couple of walkthroughs like this um, and you'll need to do the kind of bottom-up study of mm -hmm. looking at boot.js. I have, I have posted the link. It was, I think it was a Hangout 10 Oh, uh, where, you, where, where you covered uh, covered all the a uh, lot of the code, and, right. and uh, I think there is also there was the entry point where to have the first breakpoint if you really want to step through yeah. uh, the uh, let's say the init uh, of yeah. Tilwick Five. Yeah, well, I think in for, um, uh, yeah, um, I, the, what I've found in the past is if you set the dev tools to break on pause on all exceptions and. No, I think if I pause, I don't know, but we missed, oh, anyway, yeah, let's, again, don't spend your time watching Jeremy forget how to use developer tools. <laughs> so we're going to talk about how the, um, what happens when the save button is clicked. Um, and the save button in the right-hand sidebar um, is part of the um, page controls. So here, this tiddler, page controls slash save wiki, that's what is actually being displayed here as the save button. Oh, that's debugging the correct one. So I can demonstrate that by if I add hello hangout to that, save it, and build. Um, so now you can see the text, Hello Hangout, and if I click Hello Hangout, it opens the Tinder Hello Hangout, because it's a link. <laughs> that was a really bad example. <laughs> okay, so, so that's our starting point, is that the act of clicking on the Save Tiddler button is invoking the button widget. So we've got a button widget with a transclusion of the icon in the middle. And the button widget, the it's got a class attribute which just that that bit of CSS causes the button to have an invisible border. So we can go into the Snow White theme, search for button invisible, and you can see it's just got padding margin and so on, um, all going to zero. Um, okay, so now we can go into the button widget and see what it actually does when you click on it. So the button widget has the same structure as uh, all of the other widgets with a bunch of methods that are consistently used across the different widgets. Particularly the render method um, takes references to DOM nodes, a parent and a sibling DOM node, and actually creates the DOM nodes corresponding to this widget. 
So in the case of the button widget, it literally does a create element of a button widget and then assigns stuff to it. And you can see one of the things that it assigns to it is a click event listener. And then if we look here, the actions, um, it can take three different actions depending on the attributes that are set on this um, widget. So self.message, if we come back down to execute, you can see that here, this is where we collect up the attributes that we're interested in at the button widget. So we call get attribute to get the message attribute. We store it in the message property of the widget. Um, so you can see here then what this is saying is if we've got a message, then dispatch it. If we've got a pop-up attribute, then trigger the pop-up. If we've got a, an attribute set, then call that. So all we're doing is the message one, so it's calling dispatch message. And dispatch message in turn calls dispatch event. Now dis, uh, the event here is not a DOM event, it's an event in the widget render tree. Um, so this possibly is quite complicated to explain. But um, so let's take a little pause to have a quick look at what the widget render tree is. Does that make sense? Everybody, everybody with us so far? Yes. So to do this, we need to just look in a little bit more detail at the API for parsing and wikifying and so on. Now, you'll remember that TiddlyWiki defines a global called $tw. It's very useful in the command line. And $tw.wiki is the default store. You can have multiple stores, but that's the ordinary one. So I can do things like get tiddler on it. Oh, I've realized this is very small. I just made my fonts a bit bigger. Hopefully that helps. And that sh it returns the tiddler titled hello there. If I click into the fields member, there you can see all the fields of that tiddler. Yeah. Um, one of the other methods uh, on the wiki object is parse text. Um, I can't remember the parameters to parse text, so I'll type it without parameters and it helpfully will print the source code to remind me what the parameters are. So I give it a type of the, oops, mime type. That's the TiddlyWiki5 mime type. And let's give it some text. OK. So when I parse that text, what I get back is a wiki parser object, which includes a bunch of stuff we can largely ignore plus a, a property called tree, which is an array. This is the parse tree. So when I pop in here, you can see it starts with um, a node of type element with the tag P. So that's the P tag that's going to be wrapped around all of that text because I was parsing it in block mode. And then the children of that P tag, there's two of them. When I zip into the first one, it's of type text, and the text is hello. And if I go into the second one, it's of type link, and the and that's got oh sorry so uh, so it's a link widget and the attributes are in there so two and there's the type and the value of that attribute and then that's further child is the text Jeremy Rustin so does that make sense so we got what we ended up with was a p tag around the whole thing um, a text node for the text hello and the space, a link node for Jeremy Rustin because it's a wiki text link, um, and then a text node for the text Jeremy Rustin. Does that make sense? So you can see how that tree is, it's basically a, a series of arrays of what's called plain JavaScript objects. So those JavaScript objects um, don't have a prototype, for instance. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so just bear with me one second. I've just got to go on to uh, mute for a second. I'll be right back.
guys, sorry about that. Um, oh, we got, uh, we've been joined by, is this, is that, oh, it's Bob again. <laughs> um, Bob, I'm just going to add you back into the broadcast. Yeah, I keep getting kicked out of or bumped off every once in a while. It's just crashing on my tablet. Oh, well, I'm sorry. Um, uh, thank you for being patient with being with being blocked. Um, okay, so guys, sorry, we were um, we were in here. I was showing you parsing um, and showing you how um, when you parse a when you parse a block of text. The results are always the same. So, I mean, if I um, another example, um, it doesn't matter how many times I parse that, and it doesn't matter what's in the field hello. You'll always get the same parse tree back. So, um, pa uh, parse tiddlers are cached. Um, the parse tree is cached for a tiddler and then cleared when the tiddler. Um, uh, uh, the changes. Jeremy, a, a short off-topic. Is there is there some connection to the uh, to a line of a tiddler with the with the uh, parse tree so um, that we can that, that we could use it for syntax highlighting with code mirror? Uh, in some cases, there is. So the the there's a um, um, a sort of um, a refactoring that was in progress some time ago and never quite got finished was to change the Wikitext parser so that it recorded um, positions for everything. In fact, I think at the moment it'll it's, a, it's in the HTML element parser. So if I do something like this, I don't have a feeling. Yes, yeah, so you can hear start and end. Um, so this is saying that the element, very unhelpfully, the element with the tag element starts at position zero, ends at position nine. So the plan is yes to add that to um, all the parse tree nodes. Okay, because I was I was having a look at the code mirror stuff, and and if we have this information, then I think it would be possible to have yeah. a really easy uh, matching for code mirrors syntax highlighting. Yes. That's that would be my hope too. Um, okay, yeah, so that was to our own. <laughs> um, so so that's parsing, and then um, rendering is the process of actually taking content and copying it into the DOM. And in the process of rendering it, we need to actually evaluate it for want of a better term. So it's when you, if I parse a list widget, yeah. Um, then it doesn't, there's no, um, all it represents is the list widget itself and the template. There's no um, repetition within the parsing of it. It's only when we render it that it comes to, um, uh, the, 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 that you get elements repeated for each element of the list. So the render tree is made up of widget objects. Um, there's a root widget object called widget which contains default implementations of the various methods, and then each individual widget um, redefines the methods that it needs to. Um, so the widget architecture is really the, is one of the sort of big complicated things that underpins TiddlyWiki. It's how um, wiki text is converted to um, DOM elements. I mean, the parsing is really the easy part. It's the um, widget mechanism that say knows that does transclusion loops lists all that kind of stuff. Okay, so where we got to on this was that we were looking at the button widget, and you'll recall that um, we'd got as far as this guy. So when I click on the button widget, when you get a click event, we call the dispatch message function method which calls dispatch event. Now dispatch event is a widget method that dispatches um, an event down the widget tree. So instead of going um, up the 
a DOM tree in the way that you're used to. This will go up the widget tree. So that means that widgets that don't generate DOM nodes um, will get to see these events. Um, so um, in our case, um, the message that we're sending is TW save wiki. So now we need to find the um, handler that's picking up that message. And it's actually in startup that there's a little bit of code here. We call init savers to initialize the different saver modules. So the saver modules are these guys that are the different ways that TiddlyWiki can save itself as a whole file. Oh, sorry, I thought I'd turn my notification off. There we go. Um, yeah, so we call init savers to initialize all those guys. And then we add an event listener. Now you can see the ev add event listener method is being called on $TW root widget. Um, and if we go a little bit further up, you'll see that the root widget here is created within startup.js to contain um, the widgets that make up the page. And it's, where, it's what we attach. If I do this, you can see it's what we attach a whole bunch of event handlers to. So you can see some of the others, display a modal dialog, display a notification, um, scroll the page to a specified element, save the wiki, set a new password, clear a password. So all of those actions um, are invoked in the same way. The um, events that are sent up the widget tree and they're trapped at the root of the widget tree by default um, by this various, these various bits of code. Okay, so now we know that clicking the um, clicking the Save Wiki button is ultimately going to call this guy. It's going to call Save Wiki on the default Wiki object, passing it as a template um, the parameter that came down with the event and passing it a download type as well. So this Save Wiki method is on the Wiki object. Now the Wiki class is the probably the next biggest thing after the boot kernel. Yeah, it's a thousand lines. These are all the methods on the main store object. So they're things like get a text reference, set a text reference, the um, yet another type of event listeners. These are events on the wiki store where you get invoked, where you get a callback when uh, the value of a tiddler changes. Um, there's, oh, we just saw whizzing past there, um, delete tiddler, check whether a tiddler exists. Lots of um, uh, and miscellaneous methods um, and some quite vital ones, things like um, parse. Oh, um, oh, the caching mechanism. Um, right, and here are the various paths um, me methods. And if we go to save wiki, this is the function that's called um, by that event handler we just looked at. So it does standard JavaScript doodah to um, not die if options were not passed. Um, picks up the options that it needs with defaults. So the template that it's saving, um, the default is core save all. Um, the default download type is text plane. And it's calling, uh, again, on the wiki object, render tiddler to render um, the um, render that tiddler through, as that type and return the text. Does that make sense? So if I whiz back to render tiddler, you can see this is a general purpose, parsing a tiddler and rendering it to another format. Okay, so, so, so uh, this, this will um, make the tiddler wiki um, be rendered as text, so serialized or something. Like yeah, that. that's correct. So the process of, to save a tiddly wiki document, what we do is we just render that tiddler. So that tiddler contains logic that expands to be the entire TiddlyWiki HTML file. 
So by the time we get to here, um, exactly as you say, text is a string that contains the entire contents of the HTML file that needs saving. And then we call the saver module. So uh, it's immediately above. So this, uh, this is a general way to invoke a method on um, each, on the first saver module, which will accept it. So the savers um, have a priority, uh, and the priority is there. Um, and by default, it arranges the savers. It, it'll try the savers in descending order of priority. So in this case, it's calling the method save on the saver with that text and with a callback. So the callback checks. For, uh, this is a standard Node.js um, uh, idiom where you have a single error parameter. Um, if it's null or uh, un undefined, that means things worked, in which case we'll just display the contents of that message tiddler as a notification, or things didn't work, in which case we'll put up a big friendly alert. So we could again have a quick look at one of the savers, the simplest one is the, well, there's the download saver. So this guy creates an anchor element. It gives it a download attribute and then simulates a click on it um, with a bit of extra shenanigans to use a blob to build it if they're available. So that's, that code's been much the same for um, ages and ages now. It's the standard way that TiddlyWiki5 um, forces the browser to download a string. But if we look at something like Tiddly Fox, um, the Tiddly Fox saver does some shenanigans and well, shenanigans with the path name there. And then it creates a div into which it puts the thing that needs to be saved and then listens for Tiddly Fox um, to send the event I have saved the file so that it can then invoke the callback to provide the feedback. So there you go. That's the that's the complete path from clicking the save button to um, uh, to getting a file to download. Yeah, but la latest here where we uh, have this what was it called the call saver. I would have to trace it, otherwise I wouldn't know what's in this uh, list of um, savers and all that. Well, the the way to the thing you might want to look at here is uh, init savers because this guy gathers up all of the installed saver modules um, mm -hmm. and um, it sticks them. Uh, you can see into that array in order of um, their priority. So all of that is sorting by priority, and so, so things like this. Um, modules dot for each module of type, that just iterates through each of the modules that's of, well, by default of type saver, um, and lets us do something to each one. Uh, and, and Jeremy, if he wants to have a look at the Tilly Fox saver, he also has to uh, analyze the source code of, of Tilly Fox because there's some, some tricky parts in it which actually does the saving using yeah. this information which is prepared there with the... With the That's right. Yeah. So it, it, I mean, it, well, it's, you, you know the issue with an extension is that um, we, we can only communicate with the extension by um, putting stuff in the DOM. There's no way to, within a web page, to use JavaScript to invoke a method in an extension. So yes, yeah. it's very indirect. But the thing that's good about understanding TiddlyWiki is from a certain level, um, you only need to understand one of the savers in order to understand what the saver mechanism is all about. You need to understand one of them to see why it's called, when it's called. Mm. So, and it's the same with the widget. So <coughs> the list widget is pretty hairily complicated, only 300 lines, but um, there's a lot going on in there um, and would therefore be a terrible widget to start with. Um, but some of the other widgets, like the text widget, you know, is about the shortest. Thing. I mean, most most of that is just plumbing. 
Um, the reason why I was asking for the save button was I wanted to have, uh, as I requested on the in the group in the group, um, some visual feedback when I click the save button. Yeah. So to do that, we um, in the upload saver. So this is the one that we do for. Um, so I mean, really, to answer your everything that you need to know to do that is in this one file. Mm. Okay. So none of the, if, if you were just trying to add visual feedback to the XML HTTP request, this is the only place you would need to visit. So this is the um, tiddly spot saver, um, and all it does is gathers up its parameters, um, bits and pieces that it needs, and then assembles one of these hairy posts. So it's a multi-part form post, um, which contains the text, so there you can see it's putting in the, the length of the text, and there's the actual text itself. Um, and it's just using a normal plain XML HTTP request object. So what's needed is two things. In here, we need to have, um, I think it's called on progress, isn't it? Um, we need to be calling that on progress method um, and doing something or other with the progress. Um, we, in order to be able to display a progress bar, um, I, I'm, I quite like those little tiny narrow um, uh, progress bars that track along the top of the page. They're very fashionable nowadays. Have you seen that? Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. There you go. So I think that's not bad. Did you see that coming in at the top there? Yep. See it. Um, so to do that, we'll need a new mechanism, because there isn't a mechanism like that, um, which would be rather similar to the notifier mechanism, for instance. So the notifier mechanism. Um, just sits there and displays those little notification widgets in the top. I'm sorry, not widgets, things in the top right. So if I do, there's a notification, yeah. Um, and um, you can see that it gets, the notifier gets invoked here at startup, so that gives it a chance to create some DOM nodes to wrap around the um, um, to wrap around the progress bar and then we would invoke methods on it within the within this event handler here within the on progress event handler so um, that's the that's the roughly the approach I think you need to take um, it's not a great. It's not a very easy thing to start with, though, because it's a it's a UI thing, so it touches lots of bits of code. Um, I said before that that I mean it to, to other people, but um, by far the best way to get started with DiddlyWiki five coding is to take something that there are several of and to make one more of them. So, for instance, in the filters folder, here's a file for each of the filters, the filter operators. So adding a filter operator is massively easier than what you're looking at here because there's no new mechanisms that need to be created. You're just um, adding another iteration of something that there is already one of. Um, and whereas adding a whole new mechanism, such as a mechanism for progress feedback, it's mm -hmm. highly unlikely that the kind of, you know, the, the default way that you would do it based on you know, other work that you've done would be um, would probably not be the best way in a in a Tiddy Files context. The the only thing that I wanted to see is that something is happening. I don't need a progress bar. So for example if I click the save button and the save button is deactivated as long as the save is going on, this would be sufficient I think. That's also a very difficult thing for you. <laughs> okay. So look, think about think about what's going on. When we press the save button, it sends a message. So um, we'd have to change the button widget so that 
clicking on it did a fourth thing, which was just change the state of the button. Then we'd have to find a way to get the state of the button changed back again when we finished. Um, and there's nothing like that at the moment. Um, this may be it may be a useful point to to um, point you at some ang um, some. Coding for Tilly Wiki 5 is very different than coding in, say, jQuery, because um, you because the DOM is transient in Tilly Wiki 5. So in Tilly Wiki 5, if I have to do what's called a refresh, so if a tiddler changes that causes the page template to be re-rendered, then the entire DOM will get trashed and replaced. Um, so that means that if you dynamically do things in the DOM, um, they'll get smashed. Um, this happens also with Angular JS. So if you look at um, this kind of material, so this is um, advice for jQuery people learning Angular. Um, and basically, all of this advice pretty much applies to, to the Wiki 5 because Angular is solving the same, exactly the same problems, but you know, with a different audience. That um, so do, uh, if you're not familiar with Angular, you may enjoy. Um, you know, it's, it's incredibly popular. There's lots of really good quality writing about it, and as I say, um, philosophically and architecturally, it's got an awful lot in common with TiddlyWiki, and this kind of stuff that they're explaining about how you. Well, so I'm not sure that I've chosen a brilliant example, but. Um, uh, they, they, they explain in great detail why the automatic refreshing of the DOM means that you can't just um, uh, can't just modify the DOM and expect it to work. So um, you know, so even some of the if you think back to all the stuff we were looking at earlier with the type widget, you know, to do that in conventional um, jQuery would be a darn sight simpler than what you saw earlier. All that business about having um, state tiddlers and so on is um, profoundly different than normal web development. Um, but, but so it sounds like I'm trying to put you off, Stefan. So sorry. <laughs> what I, um, perhaps I'd summarize it better to um, to put it more in the form of an apology that there is a lot to learn and that the, there is a lot that is different. The reason why it's hard to learn to program in TiddlyWiki is because it is so radically different from the kind of DOM development that everybody's been doing for the last 10 years, and very different than Teddy Wiki Classic development. Okay. <laughs> so don't be put off. Um, the, so say, the, there's loads of areas that um, fit with what I said at the beginning about Choosing pl choosing places where we've already got a number of things and adding a new one. So, I mean, for instance, commands um, commands for loading and saving tiddlers and so on. It's incredibly easy to add another command for the command line. Adding filters, adding is filters, sorry, filter operators, I should say. Um, these are the built-in JavaScript macros. So the macros that are implemented in JavaScript again, incredibly easy to write one of these. There's no dependencies. On, oh, there need not be any dependencies on any other code. So you look at something like version, it just returns a string. You know, the, the simplest macro would just do that. So just the thing that returns a string. Um, the uh, parsers, um, given what we were talking about before, you might also find a, an interesting area. If you take something like the horizontal rule parser, it's not complicated. Um, and you know, here you can see idiomatically, much simpler actually than what I showed you before, how it works, that we've got a regex um, that's looking out for three or more dashes um, followed by a new line. Um, and then we've got a parse function that's called when we find one of those that adjusts the parser position to the position after the match, which it picks up from the regular expression, and then it returns an HR element. Um, something like the table one, you know, I mean, we were talking about creating table syntax, um, would be, this would be not a bad place to start, 
um, you know, the, the reg exps and everything would need to be changed, but it's doing the right things. Um, and you know, some of them, things like the lists are, again, hairy, I would say. Um, savers, again, uh, there's um, environments that we um, don't have special savers for that could be useful. Tiddly saver being an example. Um, these story views, um, classic pop and zoom in. Um, again, they're, they're fairly complicated. If you look at the pop one, um, it's um, it's actually really only got two methods. It's got a what do you do when you remove an element from a list, what do you do when you insert an element to a list, and what do you do when you navigate to an element. So sorry, three methods really. Um, and um, all that these methods do is tiddlywiki five style DOM manipulation. So we use this set style method to um, <clears throat> apply transitions and transformations. And that set style method handles all of the prefixes. So in DOM manipulations here, um, and that's it. Oh, yeah. So this is the thing for assigning styles to an element. So you can see it's just assigning to the style property. But there's a certain amount of magic to convert style names to property names. So that's all this taking out dashes and making it camel case, that kind of stuff. So um, that was just showing how although this stuff, these story views, it looks a bit complicated. It's only because one's not familiar with that set style API. But you can see literally all it's doing is jamming some CSS properties at the various elements. Um, so if you and you know, many people have, you can you can readily imagine different modes um, for that to work. Um, and finally, widgets. And again, I showed you some widgets are complicated, some of them are pretty simple. Um, and then the, the other area that I think is really ripe for contribution is in is the user interface, um, the bits of TillyWiki that, that live in these templates. So I've had lots of help in the past from Dave Gifford, for instance, on laying out the control panel. We've had a certain amount of discussion last week and in the week about the edit template as well. Um, I do note in passing, I wonder, I, I occasionally wonder to myself how complicated is TiddlyWiki 5? And one of the things I notice is that it's had quite a lot of commits, um, two and three quarter thousand commits. If you go to, um, Trending repositories on GitHub, isn't that amazing? It's, um, so here's, I don't actually recognize any of these. If you, if, if, you go for, if you go for stars and list for the for the biggest stars, maybe there's D3 or something like this. There. D3 is a good example, isn't it? Um, well, but this is not a bad case. So this this guy, JS from PayPal, has 1,000 stars. It's got 200 commits. Uh, they have 18,000 stars or, stars or something? Uh, D3 has heaps of stars. Oh, 20. Oh. <laughs> um, and 3,000 commits. So, uh, and, I, and to me, that feels about right, that um, TiddlyWiki5 and D3, they're a similar level of complexity. And that complexity is, ex is best expressed, I think, not as the number of files, but actually the number of commits, because that's how long it's taken to, I mean, D3 is a bit further through its um, development cycle, I guess, than TiddlyWiki5, but that, that's how long, you know, that 10,000 hours thing, it feels to me that to knock a piece of code into shape, to knock a product into shape, there's a kind of minimum number of commits, <laughs> so, well, not minimum number, there's minimum amount of effort, minimum number of iterations that you need to go through and uh, all I'm saying here is that that's one of the things that makes TiddlyWiki complicated, makes TiddlyWiki 5 complicated. Um, there's a lot going on. 
Yeah, and you also you already did. I don't know uh, three three times a rewrite or maybe. Which yeah, the no, other thing is committed maybe. Um, uh, heavy refactorings. Um, uh, yeah, some bits. Oh, well, that's not very helpful. It's not showing us a year. Is it? Oh no, that is. That's the last year. Right, that's the commits. So all that's showing us is that I got much busier at the beginning. Yeah, <laughs> so that was the refactoring, wasn't it? That little mm -hmm. jump down there. Um, anyway, um, your uh, and and the f another thing to say, I guess, about looking at the code is that the code is designed to be readable. What you're trying to do, Stefan, getting your head around TiddlyWiki's code so that you can contribute to it um, is um, you know, the intended function of the code is for it to be readable. So much appreciate feedback and so on making that better. I've been encouraged in the past that people have been able to come along and make contributions, um, particularly um, uh, that's uh, David Johnson who contributed um, some list filters, oh, sorry, some filter operators and some widgets quite early on. Um, let me unscreen share. Oh, no, I've done clicked on the wrong thing. There you go. Right, so as usual, Jeremy switching to Sublime Text and going through code um, did a successful job of getting rid of half of us. <laughs> but I hope it was useful to those of us that remain. Um, is there a, a we, we, I should at least be drawing to a close, um, but is there anything else, uh, any other questions or comments to cover from the foregoing? Not yet. Um, well, keep it all coming. I mean, you, um, I've ended up, I think, who have we got? Bob, Adrian, Maria, Stefan, you know, you guys at the moment, it's your dialogue that's um, really driving things a lot at the moment, so much appreciate it. No question, in the context of this stuff, no question is stupid. Um, uh, all comments um, are incredibly helpful. You know, how when we were looking at Dave's questions earlier about lists, you know, just for me to get a better understanding of the misunderstandings is is quite helpful. Um, um, Jeremy, yeah, Jeremy, I, I do have I do have one question about the the update mechanism or upgrade mm. mechanism. Do, 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 did you do any uh, progress? Yes. On this? So I've got a local branch um, that um, does the easy bit, which is importing. Um, sorry, which is making it now so it imports system tiddlers. Um, the a, I'm still pl playing with the best way of doing the upgrade process itself. Um, the dependencies are pretty hideous. At the moment, tiddlywiki.com is hosted on GitHub pages. One of the characteristics of GitHub pages is that they don't support cores, which means that the only way that I can remotely then um, retrieve <coughs> The latest version of a plugin um, from tiddlywiki.com is to use JSONP, which is really horrible. Um, so I've been doing a bit of wrestling with that, wondering mm. about moving to a different host, because um, another issue that's floating around is that tiddlywiki should really be on HTTPS. I mean, it's got yes. encryption yeah. functionality, the idea of people downloading a fresh copy of tiddlywiki off of a... Um, um, a, you know, a, a pure H, I mean, a non-HTTPS URL that feels wrong. So, um, mm. so there's a few bits mess, milling around. Plus, I get got distracted by doing things like that saving. Um, uh, but um, I hope to have the upgrade in place for mm. next week. And the um, and the syntax changes of the syntax. Do you, do you want to have this in alpha or in beta? No, I think that's what should change during beta. <coughs> yeah, because I, I, I didn't expect uh, to to have uh, syntax changes like like uh, those that you uh, discussed earlier. So uh, none of them are changes that we discussed earlier. They were all additions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but the but there are some changes. I think um, uh, it was we noted on the group that the double at symbol for assigning a CSS class. 
Um, I think that needs to change so that it generates a, um, an element to carry the class rather than trying and failing, as it does at the moment, to assign the class to the elements that it contains. Um, yeah, okay, so I, I, did, I, I did open a, a GitHub issue uh, to, that was quite similar to, to the one which uh, David did with, with, the, mm. with the discussion group. So, um, yeah, but uh, I think that the, the new syntax, uh, I don't know, that, that then we have two ways, for example, for, for example, to generate the table. There would be the possibility for this with macros and yeah. the possibilities with the, with the syntax. So, what do you think will win then? I, I think that's that's why this is a this is a, a tricky set of decisions that, <laughs> that we have to make. I mean, <laughs> the, the, the redundancy doesn't bother me because I think um, that redu if if redundancy is the best way for us to get the fluidity and expressiveness that we want, then fine, we'll have multiple syntaxes to accomplish the same thing. Um, the thing. You know, for in the for the most part, at the moment, the things that there are multiple syntaxes for, they're at different kind of levels. So there's a wiki text syntax, and then there's a pure um, widget syntax, and mm -hmm. you know that that's yeah. also bad. Yeah, I think I think uh, it it is uh, the documentation has to be good because because this may be very confusing for for newbies. So if there is if there is a good let's say Telewiki syntax that can handle I don't know 80% of the use cases, then then it's it's perfectly fine. Then we have some macros which are some some core macros which uh, let's say let people do a little bit more complicated stuff. And then, if you really want to mess with it, then you go with the widgets. Yeah, that's uh, that's, that's exactly how yeah, yeah. it. So, yeah. Jeremy, so, I, I think the widget layer is getting more fixed in that um, how widgets work, how they interact, and so on. I've done that, and I don't want to refactor that again. But the Wikitext syntax, so for various reasons, I've hardly touched it for ages. There's things like block quotes. I've never got around to adding block quotes. Um, and that's just because I'm not writing enough wiki text. Um, my door's just gone, um, so uh, I think this is the moment for me to say goodbye, and I'm going to leave you guys. Um, we'll close okay. the call now. Leave you guys on your own. Um, cheers then. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye.